will start the program. She's really instrumental. She and Kenneth are instrumental in the Josephine City Days. Uh, the Josephine School Museum is proud to be a part of the event. Uh, as I said at the, uh, at the chapel that uh, Dr. Blakey and uh, Dr. Barrett were instrumental in two years ago in, in, in organizing this. And it's taken us two years through grant writing, through research, through pushing, pulling to get it done. And uh, we're very pleased that you're here to be a part of it. And we're very pleased that Dr. Barrett and Dr. Blakey are part of it. Dr. Blakey, Dr. Michael Blakey, was a former director of scientific research for the New York African Burial Ground Project. So he's done big things. Um, he's very modest. He and Dr. Barrett now are co-directors of the Remembering, Remembering, Slavery, slavery resistance, and freedom, and freedom project, and uh, for the entire state of Virginia. So we're, we're very, very pleased to have them here with us. There are three chairs here, four, four chairs at the front, uh, if you'd like to sit please. Um, we're going to do several things. If you look at your program, there are several activities that we're going to be doing today. Uh, as you can see, the community conversation begins the, the discussion this afternoon, and that will be Dr. Blakey and Dr. Barrett. They're also, because it's a conversation, they're also going to want your input. This is a conversation. And after that, we will do uh, flower strewing activity, and I'll come back to explain that one too. How many of you are familiar with flowers, flower strewing, an African ceremony that our ancestors probably brought to this country when, uh, when they were slaves? So we're going to do that today. You'll find out more about it a little later. All right. With that, Dr. Blakey will take charge. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I'm, I'm Michael Blakey. I'm a NEH professor of anthropology at the College of Bloomingbury. And I'm here um, as a, in my capacity as co director of the Remembering Slavery Resistance and Freedom Project. We started out what, four years ago, five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was director. And so, you know, things change now. And uh, Arthur Barrett uh, has uh, risen uh, through extraordinary work and uh, work in her studies and in our project to uh, be in a position to you know, work side by side. We also have uh, Shay Windsor here, who had been out uh, early on, but two earlier occasions here at Josephine City uh, as our project uh, manager. And now, She's teaching at uh, Montgomery College and working on her dissertation. So there's an educational thing going on here. I'm just saying, you know, the steps are uh, timed continuously in our process of engaging with the public. And, you know, we're also an educational institution. <laughs> um, so the Remembering Project is is cited and situated in the Institute for Historical Biology at the College of Woodland. I need to explain that a little bit. We began as an outgrowth of the New York African Burial Ground Project, which is a major project involved uh, uh, many millions of dollars. Uh, a U.S. Uh, national monument was erected there, extraordinary, uh, sort of unparalleled, really. Uh, range of anthropological and historical research on this uh, early 18th century and perhaps 17th century uh, cemetery for the uh, for 15,000 Africans who were enslaved in New York. And we conducted that project, and I don't know if any of you saw the press back in the early 90s, but 
as our team came into that project, we brought with us the experiences that have come out, much of which have come out of discussions with indigenous people around the world who were arguing with the Smithsonian and others that they should have the right to determine the disposition of their ancestral remains and sacred objects, only that. Um, and this corresponded well with African American traditions of activist scholarship. And so as we, as uh, anthropologists, got involved, we said, you know, we will only touch these bones if the community wants us to touch the bones. Otherwise, the community should be very extended. But there are questions that we can answer that have to do with uh, the history of those people that was not written. You know, how many people knew there was slavery in New York? 20% of uh, people in New York City, maybe 50% of its labor force in the colonial period were African, <coughs> enslaved. The North was written as something, a uh, place of freedom and equality, and no, all the colonies were building their economies. So, um, and where they were written about, they were written about in numbers. So how many there were, what they were taxed for. It wasn't a human history. And so part of the reason I got into anthropology when I did a long time ago was to be able to you know, work with historical documents, if you will, artifacts, skeletons, those things that can tell us stories that are hidden, buried, not written about. But our approach was an ethical one, and the ethical approach that we had been learning from talking with indigenous people around the world was that um, you know, these stories are only important if the people are interested in them. If they are what the people, the descendants, want. Otherwise, it's desecration. Otherwise, um, what we are doing is, is inhumane. Because if people are disturbed by them, as opposed to satisfied. So we said, all right, we get a, a, a use a public engagement. And a form of public engagement in which uh, as I said, the community is completely empowered. You bury the remains immediately. Or if you want to learn something, let us know what you want to learn. What are the questions that are worthy of holding the remains out of the ground for some period of time? And if there are no such questions, then fine. People have always buried their dead. It's part of that which marks us as human beings. It's something that, as an anthropologist, and I'll speak from the anthropological point of view, we know archaic homo sapiens, you know, Neanderthals did. And only humans do it. And all humans have some sort of similar practice. This is not about religion versus science. This is about being human. So everyone should have a right, obviously, to do that. But we're also, you know, and that would make us homo reminiscens. You know, we are man who, or the humans who, the species that remembers, that memorializes. If you look at maybe that's more more us than you know man the, the wise. We certainly did that. Before that we were to the campus, man the fire maker. Okay, so we do these things. So but we also are homo sapiens. We're curious. We build histories around our minds. We have a cemetery. You have a cemetery. You have a museum. They go together. We have monuments not to be unknown, but to our, our history. And so it's with that idea that uh, it seemed the most reasonable thing was to ask the question, what do you as a community want done with your ancestors? And so that led to basically a series of better research questions that my colleagues have come up with before led to a publicly supported project in which we recaptured the history of Africans in New York in the 18th century. We went from, uh, and it was the community's activism that pushed the, the federal government from uh, its insistence on a plaque on the wall in its federal building to half a federal building, half a cemetery site, a 10,000 square foot visitor center a national monument, and so forth. These things went together, worked very well, and I think part of the process. We as researchers were part of the process working in my model that I use to promote 
I declare this now in which we work for the community. We don't work with the community necessarily. We work for the community. They say they want this, we can do this, that's what we do. Within the realm of science and the things that, that are justified by evidence. So that's our that's our history. And so the institute began to complete, continue to develop these ideas. We work with um, Virginia Indians in ways that are unparalleled, uh, allowing certain kinds of work that others others of my people might not be able to do with permission. Because you know, mass permission, you begin to establish some kind of respect right there. And if you're asking permission, you also have to be in a position to have people say no. No. And so as we continued our work, you know, training students in various aspects of engagement and bioarchaeology, increasingly we're finding you know, people are saying no. But will you help us identify a cemetery? Will you help us map it and show its parameters so that we can use this cemetery to preserve it? So increasingly, we can kind of work. Then we uh, uh, began to work with the Martin Luther King uh, Commission, the General Assembly. And I think it was out of the Richmond African burial ground, I don't know if you know about that, where uh, uh, down on Chaco, Chaco Bonnie, they struggled over, still being struggled over. So the whole thing is a very revealing kind of mess. <laughs> you know? Um, but all of these, you know, this is an interesting human struggle, and into it comes everything. It's an interesting place to work for that reason. So we have been supportive giving them information with no interest in doing research. They wanted to, our information had to do with what the extent of the cemetery is, and it still hasn't been resolved. But it did move things along. Um, so the uh, MLK Commission was interested in our identifying cemeteries across the, the state, cemeteries of the enslaved. And that has been our main purpose of this project, to identify those cemeteries. And I'll ask you, because it's very, we have to ask people for their um, <coughs> oral histories, their memories, their knowledge that your mother, your grandfather gave you. If you know of any such cemeteries, you know, please report them to our, our webpage. We are identifying them for preservation. We have no other interest in them. So when it came to us and said, the community said, we want you to do this, we have to say, you know, in terms of research, we have to say, well, what's, what are the good reasons to do that? And you know, how would you, what, what kinds of uh, methods are you talking about? What kinds of questions do you have? Are they worthy of us doing that? Are there other possibilities, other ways of doing it? If not, then we can proceed. But we haven't done that ever with this. We'll just say, just so we're, we're clear. We do that, but that's not what we're here to do. We're here to document those cemeteries so that they will not, so that you could, so they could be memorialized. And the second thing we were asked was for the Emancipation Proclamation, sesquicentennial. We wanted to know, um, they wanted us to begin to help communities uh, memorialize the cemeteries of the enslaved last year. And we said, um, and there was the idea of putting flags on the graves. And they were prepared to buy loads of flags. But you understand where I'm coming from, from the African burial ground. We said, we don't know that that's what people want. Why don't we ask the people what they want? <coughs> it's amazing how often that you know, doesn't happen. Ask them what they want to do. So we went around the state. We have in every region of the five regions of the state, we talked to 165 people. Is that right? We ask them um, a variety of questions, many of which had to do with what they find out what they wanted to do with those cemeteries. Whatever they wanted to do with the cemeteries, our obligation to help them do that. Because we work with them, we work with cemeteries in all kinds of ways, increasingly ways that have nothing to do with touching bones. And I, I can only assure you of that. Or you can look at our record. 
So, uh, which is on our website. And um, we established also a partnership with the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. They have been very good in providing uh, some financial support um, in addition to the Virginia General Assembly providing some financial support, not only by finding out what people are face a little bit about what they what we found out and what we need to do, but, but also for, for this uh, event. And, uh, so we have worked with a number, often, of, of, as Ms. Davis said, a number of African American and historical associations. It's been very rewarding. Um, uh, uh, in, 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 in the last year, uh, memorializing cemeteries, but really it became something much broader because one of the main things folks wanted to do was talk about slavery. That's what they wanted to do to commemorate the enslaved. Folks are feeling that that conversation is stunted, and to some extent, talking about racism. And uh, also, uh, we worked with Coming to the Table, uh, that uh, is an organization that is engaged in healing sessions between descendants of the enslaved and descendants of slave holders, where people can come together and talk about you know, what happened to us? Because if you don't talk about it, we know what happened if you don't talk about it. We may deny that it's what's happening, <coughs> but it's not healthy. It's not honest. And uh, maybe it's more humane. We can find the safe space and some safe topics. Or reasons that are not safe. It's important. But some good, worthy topics to talk about. Now, here is the topic that sort of resonated with us as a way of talking. We were hearing that in Virginia education, that there's not, that African American history is not taught. We were sent by one of the uh, influential uh, administrators of Virginia Public Schools, the SOLs. <laughs> the SOLs to say, all, and I read the SOLs and like all that stuff we wanted to see in the late 60s. And we, I remember bringing books into the classroom, and putting them on the teacher's table, and all these wonderful kingdoms in West Africa and Central Africa and all the major points of African American history, they're the SOLs. Now I have in my classroom, mostly white, and William and Mary, some of the premier graduates of Virginia public schools, black and white. They don't know this stuff. They don't know, the, they don't, they don't know European history where African history hit it in the, uh, <laughs> uh, the month, or with regard to the Almoravids and that, you know, 800 year or how many one counted, 500 years of total real conquest of Spain and how that affected the creation of the world. They don't know anything about it. Much less all this great West African history. So what's happened? I, I can't explain that now. What I'm saying is that what people are telling us is that it doesn't get into the classroom. We've got lots of evidence that it doesn't, but even though it has been struggled for it a certain level. And a people that doesn't have a history is being a, a made into less than people. And so to deny African American history, as rich as that is, to deny that history is to is becomes a little guy's way of saying you're inferior. It is a manifestation of, of racism. And it's systematic and it's extensive. So there's another more very specific issue, and this is this subject that we're going to talk about today, that also related very much to the emancipation population, and that's the issue of uh, resistance. 
So where slavery is discussed, 